Welcome to everyone who's joining the CBA 15 opening plenary and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever it is that you are. I'm going to take over and share my screen now. I'm going to hand over to Claire Sakia, who is going to moderate today's uh, discussion. So over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Sam. It's, um, it's a very exciting time. We're in uh, we're at CBA 15. It's... Um, uh, some way into the, this longest super year ever. Um, so uh, 2020 was meant to be the super year where we had a number of big multilateral events. Um, due to the pandemic, um, we've actually had two years of this super year with a lot of the work from 2020 pushed into 2021. But we did have super CBA 14 during uh, 2020. So this is in fact the second CBA of um, this super year. But we're now six months off um, the uh, climate change talks, COP26 in Glasgow, and, and um, uh, presumably not far off CBD, um, the Biodiversity Summit. We've got the um, um, Food Summit coming as well. So this is, a, this is an important moment for this community to come together, share our learning, discuss what's working, and, um, and think about what messages uh, we have for the rest of the world, as well as what we might take home to our own countries on delivery. So to kick us off in this um, exciting uh, week of activities, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the chair of the LDC group, His Excellency Sonam Wangdi, to um, provide a, the first remarks. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you all, wherever you are connecting around the world, and thank you for joining us online to mark the beginning of the 15th International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation to Climate Change. This is the second time the CBA community has come together online. We are all adjusting to the challenging new realities brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we welcome the commitment to ensuring that this community of practice can continue to meet interact and inspire each other. This year remains a critical year for action on climate, biodiversity loss and poverty. While our attention has been on the pandemic, these crises have not left us. The stakes have never been higher today than before. A recent World Economic Forum report found that half of the world's GDP, $44 trillion, is moderately or highly dependent on nature, which is globally under threat in many places. Indeed, all of these challenges are interlinked and the vulnerable and marginalized people suffer the most and are the hardest hit. This year, our collective de desire to bounce back stronger from the pandemic presents a tremendous opportunity. The COP15 on biological diversity and COP26 on climate change will be held towards the end of this year. We must use these moments to recommit ourselves and call the major economic leaders to provide leadership to deliver ambitious NDCs, to close the ambition gap, to keep the 1.5 degree Celsius goal within reach and to scale up support for real actions on the ground, in particular for locally led adaptation actions. The least developed countries group have launched the LDC vision to be on climate resilient development pathways by 2030 and deliver net zero emissions by 2050 to ensure our societies and ecosystems thrive. At the UN Secretary General Summit in 2019, through the Life AR initiative, we are working on the whole of society approach through government collaboration and a mechanism that will deliver 70% of the climate finance to the local level. At CBA 14, we began discussions on a set of principles on how adaptation can meet the needs of the most vulnerable. This year, eight principles are now currently gathering endorsements from organizations all over the world, from both the public and private sector. At this CBA, we will explore what those mean in practice. 
we will seek your perspectives on what needs to change to ensure all people can thrive in prosperous, resilient societies. <coughs> the CBA 15 is an opportunity for practitioners to be heard on these important issues. It is you, the practitioners and representatives of your communities who are on the front line of climate change impacts. It is you who have the knowledge and experience we need to inform future progress. The CBA 15 has five themes and discussions on these themes are more relevant today than ever before. First, the climate finance theme will explore how climate finance can be made more accessible to those on the front line of climate action. Second, <coughs> the responsive policy theme will look at how communities are pushing for more inclusive decision making. Third, the nature-based solution theme will focus on food systems, exploring how we can capitalize on indigenous and local knowledge. Fourth, the new innovation for adaptation theme will identify what works in bringing innovative ideas into mainstream. Finally, the youth inclusion theme will explore how young people can have more involvement in decision making. Alongside the workshops, I also encourage you to participate in the community boards, join the skill shares to build your knowledge and to fully participate in the conference. The CBA 15 is your platform as community-based adaptation practitioners. It is a space where your voice can be amplified and where we can push for climate action needed to protect our communities. We look forward to a very interactive discussion and innovative solution to improve the abilities of our local communities to adapt to the effects of climate change, build resilience to climate shocks, and reduce vulnerability. I thank you and wish you all success. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wangdi. Um, today, we actually are still going through, there's still all the negotiators are still hard at work um, in, in this um, rather strange virtual um, uh, SBs, the, um, uh, the, inter the intermediate climate uh, discussions. Um, so we don't have many of them with us this time, um, but we do have three excellent panelists, um, representative of this, um, this incredible group of um, practitioners and um, community representatives and uh, international partners, development partners. So um, we have uh, Dr. Mohamed Musa, who's the executive director of RAP International, who has been um, one of the Global Commission for Adaptation Commissioners alongside Sheila Patel, who between them um, ushered in the oh, oversaw and um, provide leadership for the locally led action track. Um, where we saw the principles for locally led adaptation being uh, um, uh, being um, uh, kicked off at the Climate Adaptation Summit um, and um, with over 50 organizations and countries, governments um, signed up to them now. And the other day, the G7 welcomed them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, um, very glad to have Dr. Musa with us today. We also have um, Grace Balawag from um, who is a Kankei Igorot Indigenous woman from the Philippines. I hope I pronounced that right, Grace, please do correct me. And the Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Coordinator for the Teb Teba, which is a network of Indigenous peoples um, and provides a lot of um, input and uh, influence at the climate negotiations. And finally, but by far the least, Susan Nandudu, who's the Executive Director of ActAid, um, a partner from Uganda, a long-term um, partner of CBA, and we'll be bringing the messages from CBA 14 and connecting us to the uh, yeah to the to the previous CBA. Um, so welcome you all. I wonder, Dr. Musa, if you'd like to um, make some first remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome everybody, and it's an honor and pleasure uh, for me to be able to speak uh, at this uh, point in time as we begin CBA 15. Uh, I feel humbled 
that I can uh, uh, make some remarks, especially on the locally led adaptation uh, and its role uh, in, in advancing adaptation program. Now, we all know that local communities who actually encounter the problem of climate change most, they play a largest role in, in advancing the climate change adaptation program through their local leadership. However, we also know that their leadership often uh, are under recognized, um, maybe sometimes even under appreciated and definitely under resourced. And when that happens, the, it's the women, girls, youth from the local communities, including those who live with uh, disability, those who are living in marginalized situation and face the pain of climate change most, their initiatives can get, then get sidelined. The good news is over the last few years to decade, there's more and more recognition that the leadership of local communities need to be not only recognized, but also supported. We began to see commitment are coming up and more and more organizations, including government, bilateral, multilateral organizations are making commitment to in favor of supporting locally led adaptation. However, those commitments need to be translated from rhetoric to action. And that's where these eight principles of locally led adaptation came in. These eight principles of locally led adaptation that I'm going to talk a little bit about is it an outcome of years of con uh, consultation that was led by a group of professionals from different uh, organizations. And that consultation took place with more than 50 organizations. And many of those humble leaders are here, uh, many of those respected leaders are here who reached out to communities, who reached out to various groups and really collected and obtained your views and put together the eight principles. I feel humble myself to be able to talk about that. Those eight principles, as I'm not going to go into details, are, should not be seen as eight isolated principles. They are kind of come together and they are supposed to really lead not only support to the local adaptation groups, but also they're supposed to help in transforming the way we do business in promoting adaptation, especially as adaptation stakeholders, we advance this work in adaptation, build resilience. And it's talking about transformation in the way we promote adaptation on the ground. It talks about shifting the power and responsibility to as much as possible to the local communities, to the hand of those who really promote adaptation, who advance adaptation. Among the eight principles, now some of them are very critical, starting with that making sure that the decision-making power of the adaptation goes to the local communities. And not only goes to the local communities, it also ensures this ad it addresses the structural inequalities that is there even in the, at the local level, as well as in other levels of the global system. It makes sure that the support that comes to the uh, for local adaptation is kind of more predictable, whatever it comes. It's not short-term projects. It also makes sure that we invest in building local capacities. One of the principles promotes the, the concept that what is needed is bring in local knowledge, capture, capture those local, um, local uh, uh, history, historical and cultural tacit knowledge and blend those well with the scientific knowledge to create higher values. And as we do programs, we must make sure that we remain flexible. All this also boils down to the fact that as we support and promote local led adaptation, we must remain accountable for that with transparency. And that requires a lot of collaboration. If I may highlight a few things out of these lo uh, local led adaptation eight principles, the main points it will be coming that it puts local community and local initiatives at the front and center. And that's where the journey begins. It also emphasizes that short-term project-based approach is not really going to help local communities to advance the adaptation activities because they are there, lives are there. It requires longer-term commitment. It requires more 
predictable commitment and support. It also basically says that let's make sure that local knowledge is valued, local knowledge is tapped. But at the end, uh, the local leader adaptation principles really is calling for a learning journey. Learning journey of going together with at least for 10 years together so that we learn, adjust, readjust our work and move further forward. It definitely calls for our activities to not to cause harm. I would not elaborate anymore. It's an honor and pleasure to be able to talk about these eight principles of local leader adaptation. This, these are some of the things we'll be talking further together. But as I said at the beginning, that those, local, those eight principles should not be seen as isolated principles. They should be looked at in intertwined set of principles that should really transform the way we really promote adaptation from business as usual to business as unusual. But the power of decision-making, the responsibility of doing things is at the local level. Last question is, does that mean that it takes other uh, actions from other levels off the hook? No, actions at other levels must happen. They must supplement the work of the local level. And in order for local level to really play the right leadership role, other levels have responsibilities to play. And those responsibilities include supporting local level actions, providing resources, ensuring the finance fund flows there, capacities are there, and support through monitoring learning journey and join hand. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here to learn again in the coming days from all of you in this process. Very excited by being in the CBA 15. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Musa. Really good to, um, <clears throat> to have that overview of the principles and what that means um, for CBA. And as Dr. Musa has said, this, this CBA is very much uh, firmly part of the learning journey for all of those who have endorsed the locally led adaptation principles. So um, I do hope we can, we can take this opportunity to really do, do hold each other to account learn from each other and really understand what it is gonna be that's gonna make the biggest difference. Um, so now if I could invite um, Grace Balawag perhaps to um, make your first remarks to the, um, to the CBA 15 um, community. Good evening, everyone evening. Uh, from the Philippines. Uh, greetings to all the participants for the CBA 15 and thanks for this opportunity to be able to share on the importance of linking nature and climate change crisis and its relevance to climate change adaptation. Nature and climate are definitely interlinked. This is emphasized by indigenous peoples based on our diverse traditional knowledge systems, which we have been practicing over generations. As people of the land, and being dependent on nature for food, medicines, socioeconomic livelihoods, our cultural and spiritual life. We have been practicing and had indigenous peoples are one of the practitioners and contributors to community-based adaptation actions using nature-based solutions. These contributions were being practiced long before this term NBS was adopted and promoted by various climate change and environmental bodies, conservation institutions, and even funding mechanisms. The Paris Agreement notes the importance of indigenous traditional knowledge and that this knowledge of indigenous peoples and local knowledge should be acknowledged with a view of integrating adaptation into relevant socioeconomic and environmental policies and actions. It is imperative that traditional knowledge is integrated into the local governance protocols that contribute to strengthen community resilience and multiple ecosystems as we adapt to this global crisis and challenges. This integrated approach to climate change adaptation initiatives should link the societal and environmental crisis and the current pandemic to the proven community and nature-based solutions and practices 
These include the contributions of indigenous peoples, women, and local communities as stewards of nature for generations. In turn, this should be supported by enabling policies, programs, governance, and funding mechanisms. However, all these should take into account the right to free prior and informed consent of the holders and practitioners of the such knowledge systems and innovations. To sustain these local adaptation actions, the indigenous peoples and local communities in partnership with other stakeholders will also need long-term finance and logistical support of government, development partners, and fund donors. This will further enable them to strengthen and sustain strong local-based organizations to mobilize and scale up community-based climate adaptation actions and solutions. Further, the Paris Agreement recognized the need to strengthen knowledge, technologies, and practices of local communities and indigenous peoples related to addressing and responding to climate change and establishes a platform for the exchange of experiences and sharing of best practices on mitigation and adaptation in a holistic and integrated manner. With this, there should also be clear support for local to national knowledge sharing platforms towards strengthening and protecting the best practices of traditional knowledge, the knowledge of indigenous peoples and local knowledge systems to addressing climate change impacts. Lastly, we reiterate the respect and promotion of rights and interests of indigenous peoples, women, youth, and local communities related to the design and implementation of any climate adaptation measures, including community and nature-based actions, programs, and policies on the man management of lands, territories, and resources. All these initiatives should further contribute to a more ambitious climate adaptation action that concretely contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals, especially at the local and national levels. On, on a concluding note, may we ask the community of practice participants on what CPA will be able to offer during our discussions over the week in relation to this agenda on the significance of linking indigenous knowledge on community and nature-based solutions as part of adaptation actions. What would you like to see and contribute in response to this climate crisis in the CBA 15 community and beyond? Thanks and hope to have more interactions later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grace. And, um, very important points about the, um, uh, the bringing together what the communities want to do on um, uh, what the communities would like to see on climate and nature um, uh, solutions. I think it is a really important year for us to begin to build that holistic agenda, as you're saying. So maybe first we'll go. We'll we'll finally go to um, uh, Susan and Dudu, and then maybe there'll be time for uh, some quick follow-up questions, possibly. Susan. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I am, um, I can't con be, can be considered a veteran at these conferences. Um, day four held in Tanzania. And during one of those conferences, perhaps it was CBA 10, Simon Anderson, a staff member of IAED, and bushed me with a question of why I always come back. I don't know what I mumbled on that day, but I have chewed on that question for many years. Sometimes I tried not to come, but I failed. Sometimes I, I, I think through it and I understand right now that it is the curiosity that brings me my love for learning from this great space that attracts experiences from around the world. They validate what I know. This is a very important space 
that has shaped what I know about climate change and ultimately what and how I influence conversations back home. Now, over the years, we've evolved as a community of practice from simply sharing our understanding of concepts such as adaptation, what is resilience, and how to conduct vulnerability assessments to holding discussions on what works. We challenge ourselves to tell the stories of what does not work and being bold to take the messages to decision-making tables around the world. We have established that inclusion, human-centered approaches and genuine local participation is key to adaptation success and we began to consider how nature-based solutions and young people can play their part. You have heard from Great that um, we also have to bring the indigenous communities back to the center of this conversation. We now understand the responsibility we have as a community in subjecting our experiences to rigorous questions and other views and using the synthesis to influence policy and practice. We are learning to take any chance we get for advocacy. And I want to encourage all of you who be part of the CBA 15 to, and, and those who have spaces at, at the decision-making table to use the messages of CBA 15 to, to influence those spaces because none of the decision-making spaces is too small. So today I'd like to bring just one message from CBA 14 that needs all of us to carry forward. If you have a seat at a major decision-making table, the community of practice has this to say, climate finance will deliver transformational change if we move away from the short-term cycles of two to three years. We're recommending eight to 10 years, but longer for those who are willing to take the risk for long-term transformation or change. And previous speakers have spoken eloquently about the locally led adaptation, as well as life they are. And these are spaces to watch as, <clears throat> as already communicated. Now the narrative that sustainability of our initiatives should be passed only to the governments or private sector institutions in vulnerable countries to deliver the top-down planned programs clearly is not working well. Some of the assumptions are very wrong and we should be courageous enough to face that fact. To build a resilient world, we should pass the tools to the people. And I am really glad that Mohammed has um, emphasized that we need tools and institutions that grassroots communities can access and shape for themselves. We have to, to, to strengthen confidence that is tried and tested at that level. We need, to, we need markets, we need innovation, and we need very importantly to stop putting the burden only to local governments some of who are failing to even raise local revenue that can support planning meetings. So we need an approach that includes the whole of society in the solution, starting with local people's priorities and finding ways to bring other actors to support them. So to those of you in decision-making spaces, this community of practice is challenging you to convene meetings, to talk about how to change funding cycles from short term to longer term. We are calling on your courage to bring up the subject in meetings that are convened by others, but where it is relevant. Let us do it for this generation, but more importantly for the future generations. So will you listen to our call? Well, my last message to you um, is remember to have fun. It's not all work but also some play. I know we are in virtual meeting, but as veteran Sally told us during those good old days of face-to-face -face conferences that we should 
aim to have fun um, even with such an intense conference. And I must warn those of you who are coming for the first time, these coming two days are going to be intense. You may need, want to commit uh, to meeting at least one new person just to, to have a light talk, have a light conversation. Perhaps you want to invite someone to your country uh, once we are out of this uh, serious pandemic. Thank you so much, Susan. I think we're losing you. But an important message to end on there. Um, really important points about um, us all being activists in the, in the world outside when we leave CBA with some common messages. And that message around uh, longer term commitments is, as you say, absolutely vital. So much harder for communities and uh, communities um, partners uh, to really make progress if, if the commitments are short term. And you're always having to run and think about the next grant. So longer term commitments, um, really important also to have that um, uh, focus on innovation um, and those more holistic responses, whole of society responses. Um, but I, I'm going to um, hand over because one of the things Susan asked us to do is have fun. So um, rather than this all be one way, we're going to move to Mentimeter and have an opportunity to interact together. Um, so can I hand over to Heather for um, taking us through a Mentimeter interactive moment. Heather. There, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you so much. And thank you to the panelists for kicking us off with some wise reflections there on um, uh, the opportunity of CVA 15 and the um, challenge from, from Susan to not only um, make a difference in a range of decision-making spaces, but also have fun while we're here together. I am Heather McRae and I direct the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. We are one of the core sponsors of the CBA 15 conference. And I hope some of you have used Mentimeter before. This is one tool um, that we're experimenting with um, in order to make our online conference a little bit more interactive. We're curious to know what ideas and aspirations and challenges and priorities all of you are bringing to the conference this week. And um, if you go to this website here that's shown on your screen, menti.com, you can enter this code and we're gonna have a couple of questions for you um, so that we can all get a sense of the room, just a sense of, of everyone at the conference and what, um, what their questions and priorities are. Maybe we can get the next slide here to show us the Mentimeter. Is that um, when you go to menti.com, you're going to start to see this word cloud, which is reflecting the answers that are already coming in. Um, looks like there's a lot of people who are here for networking, people looking for inspiration and new understanding. As you answer the question, watch this word cloud shift. Um, you can see there's a real um, diversity, but also some, some convergence in terms of what it is we're hoping for. I saw the word solutions come up there, connections, people looking for experience, learning from experience. We um, will capture this word cloud when it when it settles down and um, be able to share it out with everyone. It, um, it's good to see um, everyone's aspirations coming together here. New ideas, action. This is a conference that draws from action and we hope all of you will bring your experience with action. Feel free to share any reflections in the Zoom chat as well. As you take a look at this, this word cloud, if there are, there are ideas that you have that don't seem to be rising to the top, it might be interesting to bring them to people's attention on the chat. We really wanna have an active chat for this conference. Inspiration, that is a key one here for many of us coming to a conference. 
Looks like our cloud is stabilizing. There may be a few more uh, answers coming in. Um, but why don't we take a look at our second question? If you haven't yet on the mentee, move on to the second question. Here it is. What should the priorities of a community of practice on locally led adaptation be in the next decade? With this mentee question, we're asking you all to think long-term, to imagine yourselves coming to CBA 25 instead of 15. What, what will we have achieved? What priorities will we have accomplished by then? Here's some words popping up here. Nature-based solutions, innovation, finance for locally led adaptation. Finance, I'm sure is gonna be a common theme this week. Louder farmers' voices. This is often about raising voices, isn't it? Green COVID recovery. I think we're gonna hear a lot about COVID this week. It, it's coming into everything and, and your thoughts on how we move, move adaptation from a community led perspective into COVID recovery is really important. Leadership and indigenous knowledge on CBA for communities. Cross sector collaboration a power shift that sees more local leadership. By 10 years, we will have empowered local indigenous communities with resources to direct their own long-term programs. Mm. Clarity on the roles of the most powerful with respect to the needs of the most vulnerable. That would be an achievement. Reconciling the mitigation and adaptation divide for more integrated solutions. I'm just reading a few here. There's a lot of great ideas and our team behind the scenes will um, be trying to sort these over the course of the week and maybe report back to all of you. Power and money for local leadership and ideas. Ecosense, I wonder what that means. Um, growth, replication, getting finance to the local level to address adaptation and provide lessons from practice. Respect for indigenous knowledge and working toward a power shift that sees more local actors in decision-making roles. Power is popping up quite a bit here. This is a tall agenda for our community, but um, having made it this far, 15 years, 15 CBA conferences, the next 10 years um, should be exciting. And there's, there's a lot to chew on here. Um, I hope all of you will, will really have a thought about what you'd like to see this community do for its next 10 years and um, what priorities should be. Here's our third question. And those of you um, who were replying to the second one, be sure to move on to the third one on, on the Mentimeter poll. This one is, um, is really about this year, what the super year that Claire referred to. It's an important one for international negotiations. And as, uh, as a locally led community of practice, what are the most important outcomes for adaptation practitioners from COP26. This one's multiple choice and you're going to see a bar graph appear as more and more people answer the, this question on Mentimeter. It looks like um, so far, most people are calling for greater transparency and accountability of climate finance and climate action. 
but there's also, of course, that finance question, a commitment to increased adaptation funding, uh, accessibility of adaptation funding, progress on loss and damage, a formal commitment to locally led adaptation, commitment to integrate climate, nature, and poverty, and a commitment to greater tolerance of risk in the delivery of climate finance. Let's watch this bar graph shift here. See what rises to the top over the next few minutes. If you haven't yet moved on in the Mentimeter, move on to the third question here. Mm, okay. It looks like the call from this community to the COP is for greater transparency and accountability of climate finance and climate action, first and foremost. Secondly, increased accessibility of adaptation funding. And third, a formal commitment to locally led adaptation. If there's a chance, we might do this poll again at the end of the conference and see if uh, conversations this week shift your thinking at all around what our priorities should be this year and for the next 10 years. Thank you to everyone who's taken part in our Mentimeter poll. Thank you to Sam and the others um, running the polling for us and, and getting this rolling. We've, I think as a community, gotten better at some of these online tools. And if any of you um, missed a question or, or didn't get to participate or had an idea a little bit too late for the poll, feel free to add it into the chat. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Um, we'd love to see more and more exchange like this within the community and within the conference. And um, this, of course, is the opening plenary. Um, but as we move into uh, parallel sessions and smaller groups, there's going to be more and more opportunity to hear your voices and, and to um, bring your ideas into the fore. I hope, I hope this will kick off the, uh, a highly interactive and creative conference. And we'll get back to you uh, on the outcomes of this, this polling. Um, later in the week. Back to Claire and Sam. Thank you everyone for taking part in the poll. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather. That was um, that was fascinating. Um, and actually uh, very reassuring. I thought the, um, the fact that the first sort of four were around transparency and accountability, increasing the accessibility of climate finance, committing to local load adaptation and increasing finance overall um, was was in, incredibly aligned to some of the work that this community has in fact been doing over the last few months. So um, yeah, I think that's an exciting uh, indicator that we're on the right track, we're doing the right things together, and that this week will be another opportunity for us to bring that um, experience thinking together and begin to influence the next six months um, of this super year. So um, if I could ask my panelists to come back onto the screen. Um, so I, I'll just keep going. I think hopefully, um, although I can't see you, uh, Dr. Moose is there, Susan and um, uh, Grace. Um, so we had the Climate and Development Ministerial in the end of March. And at that, the, the, many of these same issues were, were raised. In fact, all four of those top four that I noted just earlier came out of that ministerial process as well. And there is a follow up to that. There's a there's a access to finance task force all about improving the way that countries are accessing finance. And there's going to be regional peer to peer learning workshops under the Adaptation Action Coalition, which um, will be trying to ensure that this community of practice are, are able to engage with and, and influence over the coming few months. Um, we we heard about um, uh, CBA having um, lessons um, from your initial um, remarks. Um, Susan, you talked about, spoke about the importance of longer term partnerships. Um, Grace about more holistic responses and indigenous knowledge. And we also just heard from, um, through the Mentimeter, about the importance of power of finance, of, of 
addressing those underlying issues like local tenure. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, what we could be collectively doing over this week and, and how we might seek to influence some of those follow-ups to the climate and development ministerial? Um, does anyone want to come in first? Dr. Musa? Yeah, no, thank you very much. I, I would also, again, uh, congratulate the team for the great in, um, inputs given uh, to the Mentimeter. Uh, quite encouraging that it fits with the uh, uh, with the priority that uh, all of us have been saying. I think one of the uh, key important point is that how do we mobilize support for uh, locally led adaptation? Uh, while I feel that still uh, we are talking about it in reality uh, on the ground, uh, the real support is uh, still inadequate. Um, and how do we therefore use uh, our uh, coming forum that uh, how do we really translate translate the uh, conversation, dialogue, or even uh, even the commitment into action. That's why, uh, one of the issues. And, and we, we have to acknowledge that it is not easy. It's easier thing to say, but when you talk about transformation, it's about talking about changing the power, shifting the power. Mm, it's also about making sure that uh, it's not only finance, for example, goes down, but also how are we making sure that at the local level, who is making decision about, uh, about using those resources? Even within the lo local level, there's a power structure. And therefore we have to make sure that at the end, the voices of those who are really uh, facing the struggles, women, it's the girl, it's the youth, it's the uh, group people living with marginalization, marginalization and struggling with uh, um, um, the impact of climate change. They have the voice as well as ability to act. It's not simple participation. It's we want them to play the leadership role. So how do we use this forum that is coming up to make sure that we translate our commitment into action? And that's something I'll be focusing on. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Misa. Yeah, important um, yeah. to keep the voice of the youth involved. Grace, sorry, please. Yes, in addition to that, of course, I already mentioned that uh, this is community-based adaptation. So what we are asking for is more support for a programmatic and a medium to long-term funding support for local adaptation initiatives. And uh, of course, I always emphasize that uh, there should be integration of locally, uh, local traditional knowledge systems and uh, practices into the climate change adaptation programs and strategies. Yes, I definitely support uh, what had been said in the Mentimeter. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Another question that I had for the panelists, um, we had the G7 over the weekend. It was overall a very disappointing outcome on climate action for the poorest countries' priorities. Um, although we have now heard that both Canada and Germany have come out with late um, climate uh, finance commitments, which is fabulous. Um, Dr. Musa, you were talking about getting finance to the local level with more predictability as being top priorities. What do you think this community can do to drive that ambition collectively? You know, it's, at the end, it, it's, it's about accountability uh, and the accountable, uh, accountability delivered to uh, this community. Uh, I know that there are hesitations and there are hesitations, there are uh, skepticism and it's about often local communities capacity. So I think one of the investments therefore should be on building local institutions. Capacity building itself is one of the areas where uh, the focus should be there and that commitment should be there. We all should be doing therefore more and more advocacy. I think from our side we should be doing more and more advocacy to help this uh, communities understand uh, and that uh, you are referring to G7, one of the reasons is possibly uh, I was thinking that have we done our part adequately to really bring evidence-based advocacy to help uh, the decision makers understand that investment here, including investment in building local institutions so that they can really lead this local, uh, local leader operation is an important area. So I would say that that's one of the key things. Let's advocate together collectively uh, and based on that evidence we have. Yeah, yeah, important. And um, um, Grace, we're coming up, I mean, this, this is, um, we, we're going to have the UN General Assembly in September, which will be the next sort of big uh, moment for all the uh, climate finance contributors coming together. 
Susan was talking about the importance of really long-term commitments. Um, we, we heard um, from, uh, um, also from you about the need for these more holistic responses, bringing together climate and nature. What would you really like to see coming out of the, um, uh, out of UNGA? And, what, and do you think there's something that this community could be discussing this week to really put pressure on, on, those, um, uh, on those larger countries, the richer countries? to help the poorest? Of course, as I emphasized in my intervention, uh, it is really imperative that uh, we have to integrate this traditional knowledge and contributions on nature-based solutions, which has been practiced by indigenous peoples, women, and local communities for the past years or for generations, as I said. and. Uh, and uh, of course, I would uh, want that in climate-based uh, and in community-based adaptation programs, they should be integrated as uh, we know that uh, climate change adaptation uh, uh, should uh, uh, really be based on nature-based solutions and contributions of local communities and indigenous peoples, as well as the women and uh, the intergenerational knowledge transfer to the young generation. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we've got one question from the chat um, around risk. Um, so in the, um, in the priorities, uh, we had something around um, being more risk tolerant. Um, so the question in the chat is, whose risk are we talking about? Are we talking about um, uh, the, the um, local adaptation finance um, that communities aren't trustworthy or responsible? Or are we talking about um, the, the, um, uh, the um, climate finance contributors um, being prepared to trust more, um, give communities more opportunity to prove themselves, if you like? What, what do you think uh, the answer to that is, Grace? Yeah, uh, it's really very challenging for indigenous peoples and local communities to access these climate funds. And uh, really, uh, and honestly, uh, we can only access these funds through other intermediary organizations who are uh, really supportive of our own initiatives and who uh, had built some confidence and trust from us that uh, we can do it as local communities and indigenous peoples. But uh, still, uh, it's uh, very, very difficult and very challenging really to, to have direct access on this at this point in time. So I hope in, in community-based adaptation programs, we will look forward into how we can simplify requirements or whatever fiduciary standards are being required that indigenous peoples and local communities could not really uh, reach or cannot uh, comply with and uh, uh, to make some adjustments on this so that we will really become uh, direct partners and not really simply as beneficiaries in this uh, in this uh, adaptation uh, and this climate finance uh, that are available at hand, but uh, cannot be uh, reached by the local communities and indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. You've raised a couple of really important points there. One about the role of intermediaries and what intermediaries should be doing. And the other about can, um, we, we, we heard from um, uh, the LDC chair about their um, LDC initiative for effective adaptation and resilience, which is around trying to get direct access for um, those LDC countries, but with then they're seeking to get 70% of that finance down to communities into the hands of local communities, indigenous peoples to actually be able to prioritize. But there's a question, um, Dr. Musa, around whether we could have civic led, whether we could have civil society led direct access instruments. Um, how, tell me what you feel about that and whether civil society has to play a different role also in being a good intermediary when they're connecting um, international levels to the local level. Yeah, this uh, locally led and globally engaged is the concept we have been working for quite some time now. 
Um, and I can only uh, share some of the practical experience we had by trying to do that. Um, civil society organizations are most critical, both getting things done in the right way on the ground, in the culturally, locally adaptable way. They also have the local knowledge to really uh, come together, to really um, connect to the global level to really move. Uh, however, there is a need. There is a need for uh, um, building coalition. You cannot have civil society organizations. Uh, few of the civil society organizations to be able to influence decisions, influence resource allocation, uh, everything. So, building this coalition, having collective voices, requires some facilitation activities. And that's why I was basically going back to the original point discussed last time, uh, last uh, few minutes ago about the role of intermediary. Often we talk about role of intermediary as kind of as if it's, it's, a, it's only grants, channeling grants. And I think uh, those days are over. That's why uh, intermediaries only channel grants uh, and, and take, uh, take stock of making sure that uh, financing and accounting are done. The more important role uh, would be therefore the intermediary who can play the real role uh, of uh, that missing middle where they come together and uh, and really bring the civil societies together, learn from them to begin with. Learning is first and most important part. Second, build collective coalition with uh, honesty and act as an honest broker to really bring them, them bring those voices uh, collectively with the civil society organization to the places where decisions are made. I would like to mention here one thing, uh, since I'm getting the opportunity to talk about this learning. You know, uh, Dr. Salim Mulok often talks about uh, this uh, longer term learning journey. And we often think that, well, what it is all about. That's actually part of the mutual capacity build and as one part of it, that if we really want to work with the civil society organizations, we need to learn from those civil society organizations first. So that we, and with, with, uh, with respect, with humbleness. And therefore, we also bring the learning uh, from others as good cross fertilizer and can bring them together. And that puts us in a better position that's why we build this coalition to really do influence the decisions and actions of policy makers, resource allocators. And that's where collective work can play the role. I hope that gives some of the perspective that I hold. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so just to note that Susan is still with us. Um, she's gonna be contributing in the chat as she says, she's been gagged by internet access. So internet access clearly has to be one of our priorities if we're gonna do more of these virtual um, engagements, um, but it is wonderful to have everyone come together um, without having to use any carbon <laughs> in flights and uh, have this conversation. So a couple more questions coming from the floor. There's one around how to get to real scale in these approaches. We know that it's very easy to do really good work at really small scale, much harder to get to real scale and get nationwide. Um, that is, again, just going back to the um, LDC chair's opening remarks, that is very much what the LDC group are trying to do. They know that they're the most vulnerable. 70% of worldwide deaths are caused by climate-related disasters in LDCs. Although they don't experience the most, it, the most climate impacts, they're still the ones that are experiencing greatest death from climate impacts. So we do need to really get to scale. Do we have um, answers to that, do you think? Um, I wonder who wants to go first. Grace, maybe. Do you think we can get to real scale with locally led adaptation? Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, as already mentioned earlier, of course, there's need for capacity building, strengthening local organizations and, uh, and uh, building from there. And uh, I also, uh, believe that partnerships and networking uh, and alliances is really effective also as well for in, for local communities and indigenous peoples to be able to access uh, climate finance and other logistical support that they would need. And uh, yeah, working with local governments uh, is also helpful. Uh, if there are opportunities for uh, support that uh, they can mobilize to, to support local, locally led initiatives. And uh, yes, I think I'll end there. Thanks. So um, actually you just touched on the role of local governments because that was another question in um, 
uh, in the chat, what do we think that lo local governments are part of the locally led adaptation actors? So, um, Dr. Musa, on, on the role of local governments and um, how we're going to really get to scale. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I uh, follow on what uh, Bess has been talking about and then I come to local government. Actually, in addition to what she uh, mentioned, this taking to the scale requires a systems approach, systems-based approach, I would say, and which begins at multiple levels of the global system, where we make sure that the locally led adaptation really gets support through systemic processes, which include uh, at the multinational level, you make sure the resource allocations are done as part of the budgeting processes, or as of the allocation processes. At the national level, that uh, when the national budgets are done, uh, it's, it's kind of channeled to the, that as a formal mechanism. And then that must trickle down. And that systems approach is kind of, therefore you, you deal with it in a way that automatically by policy, by mechanisms, by your commitment all, all, and resourcing, it gets translated. And that's that's one of the way to go. And that's why I brought this up advocacy. Now come to the question of, and then of course, I also support the idea that in addition to system-based approach, partnership is another key thing that you partner with, uh, uh, partner very well. These are the two ways you go. One other thing I would like to say, when I say systems, I also mean not only government system, but also market-based system. You know, we sometimes uh, forget about the, uh, the fact that we are in a market-driven world now. And uh, how do we really work with the market-based approach that allows us to really take uh, this local adaptation further forward? And it becomes part of the integral part of the businesses, integral part of the markets. And that, that's an important idea. Now, local government. Local government is both should be both a supporter, financer, capacity builder, and actually uh, um, uh, 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 and hold themselves accountable to the local communities to make sure that the resources that are coming to the local locality are used for the local uh, by the decisions by the actions of the local leadership so local government sometimes can become an isolated entity in itself if really they are uh, distant from the local real local leadership if their decisions are not actually uh, for, um, owned also by the local communities so local government has an opportunity that by definition, they're near to the people. Uh, they have an opportunity to really go out to the community and sit with them. Nowadays, we are quite familiar with some of the good uh, participatory tools. By using those tools, you can really make sure that local communities not only participate, but also own some of the decisions that local government will take. They can, and they can be honest about it and therefore really put forward the uh, resources and support to the local communities to lead this. Local com government also needs support from the national government in order to be able to do that. And th that support needs building local government's capacity to be able to support local lead actions. Local government's capacity should not be just taken as granted. It has to be built to be able to really lead local lead adaptation. And that's why there's a kind of role that national governments and uh, capacity building institution and the role of communities like us um, do we have we can engage with local government to be able to help them enable that thing happen okay thank you so susan's um interventions in the chat she's just noted that um cop 26 ministerial um uh, brought out some important solutions but it, it's a clear need to increase integrate transparency of climate finance in order to support the accessibility improving the accessibility in the in the proposed um access to finance task force an important point there. She also is agreeing with you both on the um, how to get to real scale. She, she agrees with the argument of partnerships and um, notes that in the coming days, there's, there's quite a lot on um, learning coming out from the sessions on demonstrating the partnerships across community, private sector, governments to inspire scale up and to ensure the sustainability of adaptation action. Um, so um, another question that's come out is, um, is there a preference between the type of uh, locally led adaptation that takes place? Is NBS by its very nature better than a technology led adaptation approach? Um, and there's also questions around how we can use the internet um, and learning um, through the, um, digitally um, to, to begin to learn across scales, both across countries, across communities, as well as vertically between communities and, and higher levels. So uh, some thoughts on that. Do you have a 
do you have an instinctive preference for NBS over any form of technology or, is, or does it depend on the circumstance of what needs to happen? And uh, what do you see as the opportunities for digital learning for this community of practice? Um, Grace, do you want to go first? Yeah, for, for indigenous peoples and local communities, it's really, again, another challenge uh, with this pandemic. And we're in, we are um, more or less uh, more connected with internet and uh, and it's it's really a great challenge for all of us uh, uh, some of the activities that we are supposed to do locally have not been uh, achieved for this season where in within this situation where a pandemic is so uh, we do it through partnerships we have partners at the community level we work through local governments as well and uh, try to see how how to connect at the local level or how the local level can connect at the subnational to national level through these partnerships that we build we also conduct dialogues uh, among various sectors among various partners and uh, try to come up with some uh, actionable strategies that uh, can really uh, respond to the situation, to the difficult situation that we have now. Uh, yes, I know uh, there are uh, some, there are successful stories, even within this uh, situation, uh, communities and indigenous peoples continue to uh, have their locally led uh, adaptation uh, activities and programs and uh, they have their own initiatives and efforts to really respond to the situation at their own uh, pace and at their own capacity because of uh, limited uh, support systems at this point in time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, Dr. Mesa. You know, I would say that, you know, uh, uh, COVID-19, while it was one of the worst experience of all of us in the last one and a half year, did open up some opportunities for us to test some innovations and learning, especially around digital means to uh, do extension. Mm, you know, and we tried in, in various programs, including, uh, including our uh, community-based programs. And... Uh, our, our experience has been uh, quite amazing that uh, you, you can you can you can reach to the people at a scale and and even facilitate uh, um, collectivization of the people even when maintaining social distancing to do things collectively that you need to, need to be done so that was quite a, a, amazing and interesting experience it can be done i agree with Chris that we have to be mindful that not every place is still have the internet connectivity adequately but i my gut feeling is uh, the, the way the, uh, the internet penetration uh, that, uh, is happening, a uh, large part of the people will be uh, in the reach uh, soon, and even, even indigenous people in various communities. Question is, are we reaching in the way that they find meaningful, they find useful? It's not just reach, it's also reach in the way that helps them to come, to, uh, uh, come together. So that's one comment. But I would also like to take another comment in this regard. This, uh, and locally led adaptation should not be understood as a technical problem only. Uh, um, there are technicalities into it, financial, technical. It's also a social, uh, it's basically a power issue. It's just, uh, political and social aspects of it, we should not underestimate it. Sometimes we forget that maybe a technical solution will solve everything, but that's not the case. I, uh, our personal experiences and organizational experiences in that as much as it's technical, it's also political and social in nature. Unless, and over there, unless we really make sure that we have a, a, a appropriate methodologies to deal with that. And actually, not only methodologies we have, are we really acting on that together? Then you cannot bring those technical and socio-political aspects together and cannot really make the proper difference that we are looking for. Fabulous, thank you. I think that's that's really important. And that's a, um, a, a view that um, uh, uh, Susan's also suggesting in the chat. We shouldn't have preferences. We're running out of time, um, getting to um, too fast, uh, getting to 1.5 degree scenario too fast. And we just need to scale up as much as what works as possible simultaneously. 
I think the point about this all being about power is another thing that's come out in the chat. Um, but Ganey suggesting that um, it's not always so simple that local governments can work with communities. Sometimes they don't have very much power either. So it is actually a matter of us really beginning to tackle with these thorny issues um, in multiple places. So um, um, just a final one minute final word from, from each of you, um, if you would. What, what would you like to see coming out of CBA 15? And um, Susan, if you wouldn't mind doing so on the chat as well. Uh, Dr. Musa, why don't we start with you this time? Yeah. No, I think I will be building on what I was saying that uh, last time, that it's time for us to take this head on. <laughs> and, and, uh, and don't shy away from the fact that um, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we have been a little bit conservative on this. We, we are talking about dealing with this local adaptation um, in a way that it's, uh, it's, it's okay to let some of the uh, some of it go at a, at a level that's going now. Uh, we are talking about really making fundamental shift. We are talking about transformation. Who decides uh, about where the uh, where the adaptation resources will be used, uh, and why it is decided? Why is the voice of those who are living at the forefront is in this whole decision making process? Are you sure that we are honest and uh, and genuine about getting that ownership of the decisions of adaptation at the hand of the people who are at the forefront, or are, are we just talking about keeping it as tokenistic? I would like to see that in the CBA 15, we are touching some of these difficult questions. Uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and let's not shy away from that uh, if we really want to make the difference. It's a great opportunity for coming here in the CBA 15. I feel, again, humble. There are much more knowledgeable and, and uh, uh, professionals here than me. And so I feel a little shy that I'm talking here. Uh, but my humble present would be that let's not shy away from doing things that needs to be done. And it's time to be at speed and at scale. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, for me, as I emphasized already in my in my intervention a while ago, uh, even with this climate crisis, even with this pandemic situation, indigenous peoples and local communities were able to adapt on whatever way that they can uh, uh, because they are nature-based people and uh, they maximize the opportunities that uh, nature offers them and they have their own indigenous and uh, local community perspectives on how to really uh, maximize these opportunities that nature is providing them. So it's really very important to integrate nature-based solutions in every action that we do, especially at local levels. And uh, of course, uh, as I also mentioned, uh, respect of, uh, rights and the interests and the self-determination of local communities and indigenous people should also be acknowledged in this uh, whole process so that uh, we can do whatever we can to contribute into this uh, climate crisis and in this pandemic situation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grace. So um, a, a really important concept actually self-determination in many ways that is the heart of locally led adaptation. Um, and that respect of rights and interests chimes very much with Dr. Moose's call for tackling the elephant in the room. Um, <clears throat> and NBS being actually a natural solution for communities very often, they may not even know about technolo technological solutions that might help, but they know the nature-based solutions ones, and, and that's part of the, the need to translate, to bring all of those different forms of knowledge together, so they have a full range of, of options to choose from. Salim Huck, who is of course the grandfather of CBA, noted in the chat that every governance system is tension between different actors, national and local officials, and the opportunity to find allies with local government to lobby national government is there. I think that's an, also an important um, closing remark. And Susan Nandudu's um, pointing out the, the innov innovative nature of solutions that are coming from the voice of indigenous peoples, young people, when they're brought to the decision-making table that can really help advance adaptation action at greater scale if that finance resources and uh, um, rights to, to make those decisions are given. So thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful start to CBA. It has to be one of my favorite moments of the year when we all come together. 
Um, I hope we're not going to have too many technical difficulties over the year, but obviously we are all joining from very different levels of brand broadband width. So um, we're going to have to be tolerant with each other. But there are also Slack channels and so on. So even if you're struggling to have the conversation in the room when, you're, when your video has to be off so that you can hear and so on, there are other ways to engage. So let me hand over, uh, thank my panelists very much, Dr. Musa, Grace Balarag, and um, Susan Nandudu, who's managed to engage even though her internet didn't allow her to speak, um, and hand over to Sam about all the different ways um, this CBA is going to be running over this week. Thanks so much, Claire. And Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. Thanks very much to our panellists for a really lively and interactive discussion and to everybody also feeding in uh, on the chat. I want to share some really exciting opportunities with you just before we close today uh, and we go on to think about the conference. So uh, firstly, I want to uh, introduce you to the Catalytic Grants. So thanks to the Global Resilience Partnership and the International Centre for Climate Change and Development, we have uh, the opportunity to share with you a grant to develop an idea. So if you are taking part in CBA, you're in a session, you're in a Skillshare, you're on a Slack channel and you get chatting to somebody uh, in which you have an interesting idea. Um, funding is available for you to take that idea further. You could get up to £5,000. All you have to do is sub submit your idea after CBA 15 through an application form. And what we really want to encourage is collaborations of teams from different organisations on innovative ideas. And winners can receive seed funding, support, access to knowledge and tools. Now, to find out more information, there is a video on the main page in the atrium of the conference platform. And that's where I'm going to take us to now, just to share a little bit about how you can interact at CBA and some things that it's really worth bearing in mind today before the major session start tomorrow. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share uh, a different one. So what you're looking at now is the conference platform. So what you're looking here is the agenda. Now, this agenda is searchable by theme uh, and you can search by track, gender and mail, or you can search by type of session. So all of this is fully searchable. Now, the first thing I want to draw your attention to today is the coffee chats. Now, these are networking chats. You can be matched with somebody by interest and by language, and you will be randomly put together with somebody where you can chat about what you're interested in. So I was noting and really pleased to see that uh, during the word cloud on the Mentimeter, everybody's, uh, one of the major uh, priorities was on networking. Now the coffee chat is exactly for that. Bring a drink, uh, you can talk for as little or as long as you want. You can even invite other people into your chat. So uh, please do sign on for the coffee chats. There is one at three o'clock British summertime and another one later on. Uh, it'd be really, really great to see you. I myself have had a couple of really fascinating conversations already this morning, uh, and I really hope that I get to have a few more with others uh, later on. The second thing I want to urge you to do is to remember to sign up for your sessions. And that's really, really easy to do. Now, signing up is important because it lets us know how many people are coming, but it's also necessary so that you can see the Zoom link for the session so that you can join it. So if I just click on this session here, uh, if I visit that and scroll down, I can hit sign up to session here and we can actually see this one is already filling up. And once I'm signed up, that is going to make sure that the Zoom link is shared with me on this session page 20 minutes before the session. So please remember today, before all the sessions start, have a look through, see what you're interested in, and please sign up to the sessions that you are intending to go to in order to get the Zoom link. If you change your mind and you can't then attend the session, you just hit release my seat and that will create the space again for somebody else. So if you do find that you're not able to go to a session, please just come back in the session page, click the button, uh, and that's going to free up the space so that somebody else can join. The last thing I want to draw your attention to 
is the Slack community boards. Now, anybody that remembers last year on Hoover, we had a, a community board discussion and over 10,000 messages were shared. Now we can do that again this year, but the nice thing is that our Slack community boards will continue after the conference. So if there is something at CBA that isn't being discussed that you think is important, something that should be part of the program, but there hasn't been space for, please join us on Slack. You can start your own conversation about it. You can even let us know that you want to set up your own miniature roundtable discussion on the topic, and you can share any messages that come from that discussion with us. So please do explore the CBA workspaces. There are already really interesting conversations happening about climate resilience, about monitoring and evaluation, about transformation uh, and more. And it's a really great way to network and connect with others. So with that, I want to thank everybody who's joined us for the opening plenary today. I want to thank our panelists uh, again for a really interesting discussion. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, meeting you and uh, uh, for the discussions that will take place over the next few days. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a great CBA.